Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I am Anna Lorenzini, and I am part of the ITSS Verona Member Series on Middle East. Today, we have the pleasure and the honor to converse with Ido Levy, to whom we will ask an overview of the, the action and strategy of the major terrorist groups, especially in the Middle East. We will also try to understand how the role of some recent events, such as the upcoming Israel elections or the resumption of power by the Taliban in Afghanistan, can influence or facilitate the work of these organizations. Before proceeding with our conversation, I would like to introduce our special guest. Ido Levy is an associate fellow working with the Washington Institute's Military and Security Studies Program and a PhD student at the American University School of International Service. He holds a Master of Public Policy from Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. In, two, in uh, 2018, he received his BA Summa Cum Laude in Government, Counterterrorism and Global Affairs from ICD Erislea. He was also research and teaching assistant at the McCourt School of Public Policy and editor in chief of the Georgetown Public Policy Review. His work has appeared in ICT studies in conflict and terrorism, Middle East policy, terrorism and political violence, Small Wars Journal, NBC, and Jerusalem Post, the foreword and other publications. In addition to his numerous publications, he also recently published his first book, Soldiers of End Times, Assessing the Military Effectiveness of the Islamic State. His work focuses especially on Near East policy, on counterterrorism and military operations, particularly relating to jihadism, jihadist groups. Before we start, I would like to thank you for being here today with us, Ido. Thank you, and what a great introduction. Oh, it is all true. I mean, <laughs> so uh, without further ado, let's start with our interview. So um, recent data has shown that there has been a decrease in the number of terroristic attacks against the West in recent years. Can we still say the West is still the main target of Islamic terrorism? And where does this animosity against the West come from? It is just ideological. Uh, yeah, as as long as as far as uh, terrorism against the West from jihadists, uh, it was actually a very short period of time when the West was the main target. Um, this this was really the time when uh, Al Qaeda was the main uh, group in in charge of the global jihadist movement. This was kind of uh, the from like 1996 through uh, 2001, uh, uh, after the 9-11 attacks, the, sh the focus shifted away from the West. Um, and uh, th this is very much an, an ideological issue because Al-Qaeda, uh, their whole ideology is that the West, uh, their, their theory of what's going on is that the West is propping up uh, governments in, in the Middle East, corrupt secular governments in, in their view in the Middle East, and if uh, we, uh, if they get rid of the uh, US influence, it will allow them to, uh, it will allow the jihadists to finally take over and implement the, what they think is the correct uh, form of government in these different countries and recreate the caliphate, which is their ultimate goal. Um, so that that is a very ideological issue, especially when Al Qaeda was, uh, at the head of the jihadist movement, that's why they made so much. Uh, uh, they made such a fuss about attacking the West, and rhetorically, in the rhetoric, they still do. Um, when ISIS uh, rose, or I should even before even ISIS rose, uh, Al Qaeda franchise after after the uh, nine eleven attacks, uh, all of Al Qaeda's major affiliate groups, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al Qaeda in Iraq, uh, Al Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, all of them. Uh, at some point, tried to take territory and and hold it. So they they deviated from uh, take territory and hold it not in 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 their areas of operation in the Middle East and North Africa, um, or the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, and they deviated away from this this vision of uh, of f first fighting the West and then um, taking the territory for the caliphate. Um, so, and uh, and this continued with ISIS. ISIS took it a step further and said that uh, if you're not 
uh, doing that, if you're not actually looking to take over territory, uh, if you're only interested in terrorism, which is kind of what Al Qaeda's uh, version was, then then you're even an apostate and you shouldn't even be considered uh, Muslim, let alone a jihadist. Uh, that that was the the ISIS view, and that's the view that's pretty dominant uh, now in in the jihadist world. Um, how far how far they take this? Whether we can call other jihadists uh, apostates, you know, it's kind of a niche issue. But the but the most po- the popular thing about jihad for jihadists is actually going and fighting and taking territory and recreating the caliphate. So this idea that that bin Laden had, uh, Al Qaeda had about um, for, first fighting the West and then recreating the caliphate wasn't very popular and still isn't very, very popular. And that's why we also see jihadists not as interested in attacking the West as they used to, especially as the uh, Al-Qaeda central uh, has become kind of uh, become weaker and its its role has kind of become more to, to uh, hold together its affiliates who are more interested in uh, local operations, like I said, taking territory and governing. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. And in recent years, we have heard a lot about, for example, sorry, um, could you describe the main strategic differences between ISIS and Al-Qaeda, especially in their approach of, to fighting the enemy? Because uh, you have already said something uh, in your answer, but something more in deep. Sure. Um, so Al-Qaeda's whole uh, ideology, um, it comes from... We, we can go all the way back to, uh, you know, the Mujahideen resistance against the Soviet Union in the 80s uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and that's the experience that kind of shaped the Al-Qaeda vision, uh, which was about um, we first have to eject the infidels. In that case, it was the Soviets. Later, it became the U.S. Uh, and then we can uh, take power because that was the experience of the Taliban. And look, after the 20 year war in Afghanistan, that's also the uh, experience that they had with uh, the Taliban had again with the US. Uh, so the, that's kind of how they developed their theory, their their ideology. Um, and uh, an important point here is that they emphasized fighting the so-called far enemy, which was in, at one point the Soviet Union, later became the US or the West. Um, and uh, that's and as opposed to the near enemy, which are the corrupt regimes or secularized regimes in the Middle East or Afghanistan uh, or places that uh, uh, they claim to be part of the caliphate. Um, so that's that's really the emphasis for Al Qaeda. And they deprioritize things like fighting against uh, Shia, which the jihadist movement considers to be uh, the, the Sunni jihadist movement considers to be apostates and uh, you know, some of them consider them to be the Antichrist, uh, and uh, that's why we see ISIS targeting them. But um, Al Qaeda kind of put this issue aside. Uh, for ISIS, uh, when ISIS rose, one of their big distinguishing points was their obsession with the apocalypse. That they uh, believe that the, that's why my book is called Soldiers of End Times because the, the ISIS uh, fighters wanted to be part of this apocalyptic war. That would be happening between the um, what they believed were the Muslims versus whoever is the non-believer, um, and so and with this apocalyptic vision, uh, they saw the Shia, for example, as uh, as as a, uh, companions of the Antichrist that would appear in the end times that they had to be fought. Um, the West is kind of seen as more distant, not as important, because what we need to do is to create the caliphate in the present. So that we would have, we will be able to participate in this great war that is to come. Um, so this is a big difference. Al Qaeda doesn't really think about the apocalypse when it comes to uh, their strategic vision. For ISIS, it's a very important part of their strategic vision, and because of this uh, big difference, ISIS also considers anyone who delays or um, the irja, the the people who uh, delay the um, recreation of the caliphate, are also apostates. That's why. ISIS um, has considers the Taliban, Al Qaeda, other groups that don't share its vision to be apostates. And really, the only way to ally with with the ISIS is to pledge allegiance to ISIS, actually join ISIS. Um, so that's a, a the major difference, and that's also why there's uh, such a deep conflict right now. 
between ISIS and Al Qaeda. Oh, um, and in recent years, we have heard a lot about foreign fighters phenomenon. And what do you think made ISIS more attractive in a sort of way than Al Qaeda to convince so many people to join the organization? Sure. Um, so for for ISIS, it's really, I would say there are two things that really distinguish um, ISIS as, as an appealing alternative to Al Qaeda. One of them is, like I said, the apocalypse. They're focused on the apocalypse, which seem which is something that for some reason, uh, you know, I'm not really, I'm not a psychologist, but for some reason, uh, it's something that's appealing to people. Thinking about the end times, being part of the apocalypse, thinking about the end of the world, it's, it's something that appeals to people. Um, and uh, the other thing is uh, the caliphate, which uh, is probably the, you know, it's a, it's a very popular thing uh, to say that they uh, that you want to recreate the caliphate and that you're you're actually doing it. It's something that um, is very attractive, especially to jihadists who that, that's their main goal. Uh, Al Qaeda uh, is after all these years of terrorism against the West, hiding in caves or whatever. It's not something that's very popular uh, over such a long period of time. What, what the jihadists want to do is go and fight and recreate the caliphate. Uh, and ISIS actually did that uh, in, in their view, that they took over this piece of territory. They implemented their own form of governance. They implemented uh, what they thought was the um, right uh, version of Islamic law. Uh, and they told people to come and settle in our in our empire, because this in this place, you can be a true Muslim. You can uh, practice your faith correctly. Um, and live in the caliphate where you should live if you're a true uh, believer. And so that's something that was very uh, attractive. The other thing with ISIS is that because they had this kind of holistic view, they said, bring your families, you know, come everybody. This is, this is a caliphate for everybody, not just for the few, which Al Qaeda was kind of seen as like this, um, you know, just for the elite, you know, people who are deeply uh, indoctrinated or have a lot of deep learning and have thought about this a lot. This is like, no, this is for average, average everyday, everyday Muslims to come and live a uh, proper life. Um, and that's why also you see whole families coming, people joining with their friends. Uh, it's uh, It was just a much more appealing model. Yes, because uh, we saw also a lot of uh, uh, Western girls enjoying this kind of organization. So it's quite interesting and at the same time, a terrible and uh, uh, phenomenal. Uh, but anyway, moving um, to specific areas, uh, before you mention Afghanistan. So uh, I have a question related to the uh, touristic movement in Afghanistan, especially uh, after the takeover of of the power of the Taliban in Afghanistan. So um, as for Afghanistan, we know that, quoting you, uh, in the past, it was a safe haven uh, for Al-Qaeda. Do you think that uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2021, Taliban takeover of the power could also represent a new recovery of power and territory for Al-Qaeda, uh, like a new chapter in international terrorism? Uh, it, yes, it could. Um, the question is what, what the impact will be, because for sure, what we know for sure is that the Taliban is, is allowing Al-Qaeda to, to live in, in its territory in Afghanistan, uh, like they did, uh, you know, more than 20 years ago before the U.S. invaded. Uh, that hasn't changed. There are still very strong, uh, close relationships between Taliban and, and Al-Qaeda. That's probably that's not going to change. The question is what Al Qaeda is going to do with this newfound um, sanctuary in Afghanistan. Uh, for sure, there, like I said, the the top leadership um, is still interested in focusing on the West, but all of Al Qaeda's affiliates, uh, Al Shabaab, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the ones that I've talked about before, they're more interested in taking over territories in their local areas of operation. Um, and what Al Qaeda has recently, uh, the top leadership recently, what their purpose has been to kind of uh, hold these affiliates together, uh, keep them committed to the Al Qaeda vision, uh, so that 
they over time they can get stronger and stronger and maybe form together um one one day uh after the the west is ejected from from the middle east so it's not it's not clear um what al qaeda is going to do with this newfound uh sanctuary maybe they they might be right now prioritizing um keeping their affiliates together making sure their affiliates um have what they need to succeed um but uh they they could also because it's one of their their main goal really is to uh hurt the west they could also use it to uh plan terrorist attacks like we've seen them be, done doing before um so it's and it also i should say it also really depends on who the new leader will be because right now uh, al qaeda is in a leadership transition since the us um uh killed uh, ayman al-sawahiri um and uh we are waiting to see who will be the next leader if the next leader it could be that the next leader will be less focused on the west and more focused on al qaeda's affiliates um but yeah we'll we'll see yeah um all, always trying to move to other areas i think that's another uh, point that is really relevant in this sense uh could be for example the uh the upcoming Israeli elections uh, that in two weeks and the and echoing the words that the director of the Shin Bet, Roland Barr, delivered at the last World Summit on Counterterrorism at the, the ICT. Uh, quotes, the political instability, the growing internal division, the breaking of common historical denominators and the de de radicalized discourse. All these are shot of encouragement to the countries for the access of evil, terrorist organization, and lone aggressors. And I want to know your opinion. I mean, this is the fifth election in three years. Do you believe this constant political upheaval in Israel is a potential of a terrorist could exploit? Uh, I think that uh, the political instability itself not, not not necessarily that doesn't necessarily make Israel more vulnerable to terrorist attacks. Um, maybe what what we could see is that uh, there's a lot of polarization now in Israeli society. Um, and also at the uh, World Summit, a lot of the, something that a lot of the the um, Israeli experts there uh, emphasized was um, the internal threat to, to Israel. Uh, that growing divisions and polarization is is a, is also a security threat. So that could be something that terrorists take advantage of. Uh, we've already seen them uh, try. Uh, we've already seen some some activity in in that respect. Um, but uh, the political instability itself, not not necessarily. It could also uh, compromise efforts to create, um, you know, long-lasting policy to to counter uh, these groups. Um, but uh, but yeah, the main the main issue I would focus on is the polarization in society and how uh, groups could exploit that. Okay, and. Speaking instead of another scenario that is worrying the world very much lately, since the invasion of Ukraine earlier this year, there is a perceived pivot away towards more conventional threats. What do you believe are the potential ramifications uh, of this in regards to the West's counterterrorism policy? Um, so I would say the the pivot towards more conventional threats. I would call that kind of great great power competition, okay. uh, and we've we've kind of seen this uh, shift happening even before Ukraine. Uh, actually, since in the U.S. since the Obama administration, uh, there has been an effort for the U.S. to rebalance or to pivot towards Asia to deal with the threat of China, um, more uh, also to keep an eye on the threat of Russia. Um, and Ukraine is is uh, seen as kind of happening within in this context of look the the rising threat of Russia the rising threat of China, um, so and and the the implications of that trend for uh, there are implications for for that trend to, for counterterrorism um, because we've seen that the way the administrations have seen the Middle East is a play, a kind of a quagmire a place that we have to withdraw from. Uh, actually, I actually have a report coming out soon where I talk about this more in depth, but um, basically uh, the, the Middle East is seen as a place that we have to withdraw our resources from to 
so that we can redirect them to other more more important uh, theaters like China or, or Russia. Um, but I, I see this as as a, as a as a mistake. We have seen, uh, for example, fewer troops now being stationed in the Middle East, fewer U.S. troops, uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, but we've also seen that these reductions have caused more instability. We've seen Afghanistan fall to the Taliban. Um, things that we uh, are, are are trying to avoid, um, and they're they're all our withdrawal from the region is just going to make things worse. Is 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 really that that's how we should be seeing it. Um, so I think it would be much more useful if uh, the U.S. would look at the Middle East as to, as another theater where great great power competition could be occurring. We've seen Russia, especially Russia. Um, try to project power in the Middle East with its um, operations in Syria, especially. Um, yeah, and for example, and yeah, that's just one example. But uh, you know, we've also seen China try to get into some markets, uh, expand its its footprint into the Middle East. Iran, of course, is I mean, uh, doing all kinds of activity, and they feel all of these actors feel feel emboldened by uh, the U.S. stepping back, um, and it's just going to harm us in the long term, whether it's in great power competition or in counterterrorism, uh, these two things are very much interrelated. So uh, we, the, it's the wrong approach to step back. We should engage uh, e even within this context of great power competition. Oh, that's, uh, I mean, uh, we know it's quite a very, very tough situation and we hope that everything will uh, will be sorted out as soon as possible. <laughs> anyway, um, I have to say that your intervention was really interesting and it gave an overview of the delicacy and importance of the issue, uh, especially counterterrorism. And thank you to move uh, with me from uh, a country to another one. Um, I would like to thank you so much for being here with me today. And I hope that you also enjoyed uh, our conversation and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, thanks. It was uh, great to do this. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much.